Welcome as we continue our midweek Lenten journey. As we go to another place today, we go to Bethany. To begin our worship, we'll begin with our invocation and call to worship. Please rise. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God, the fellowship of the Holy, of the Holy Spirit, be with you all. Amen. Let us ever walk with Jesus. Behold the gift of his forgiveness. To gaze upon the eyes of his grace. Marvel at the magnitude of his mercy. We walk with Jesus today. And into the house of Simon the leper. Mary prepares Christ for his burial by anointing him with perfume. Faithful Lord, with me abide. I shall follow where you abide. We'll join in our opening hymn. You can be seated for that. Through her generosity, we 
catch a glimpse of your joyful and generous kingdom. By your Spirit's power, enable us to live and give like her. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading from Exodus chapter 36. Bizael and Oholadeb and every craftsman in whom the Lord has put skill and intelligence to know how to do any work in the construction of the sanctuary shall work in accordance with all that the Lord has commanded. And Moses called Bizael and Oholadeb and every craftsman in whose mind the Lord had put skill, everyone whose heart stirred him up to come to do the work. And they received from Moses all the contribution that the people of Israel had brought for doing the work on the sanctuary. They still kept bringing him free will offerings every morning so that all the craftsmen who were doing every sort of task on the sanctuary came each from the task that he was doing, and said to Moses, the people bring much more than enough for doing the work that the Lord has commanded us to do. So Moses gave commands, and the word was proclaimed throughout the camp. Let no man or woman do anything more for the contribution for the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing, for the material they had was sufficient to do all the work and more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle readings from 2 Corinthians 8. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our Holy Gospel is also the basis for our message this evening. You can remain seated. From Matthew 26. Now when Jesus was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask, a very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head and as he reclined at table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, Wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We sing our sermon hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
mercy and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today our attention turns to the town of Bethany. In Jesus' day, about 20 families lived in Bethany. In 2017, the population of Bethany was 22,180. Bethany is on the southeast slope of the Mount of Olives. It's about two miles east of Jerusalem. It was a distance that was considered a, a Sabbath day's journey, so it would have been a popular destination without breaking any rules of working and traveling on the Sabbath. You pass by Bethany on the famous road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, the name Bethany can mean several different things. Some understand it to mean the house of affliction. And that could be a reference to the fact that Simon the leper, this is what remains of his house. This Simon the leper was a man who once must have been afflicted with a skin disease, but was cured now possibly by Jesus himself. So he had what remains of that home there. Mm -hmm. Others, they understand Bethany to mean the house of figs. And this could be a reference to Mark 11 when Jesus was walking from Bethany and he became hungry. It says, And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not a the season for figs, and he said to him, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. So that could be where it comes from. Still others call Bethany El Elazaria, which means the place of Lazarus. This is an obvious reference to John 11 when Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And this is where his tomb traditionally would have looked like and where it was. Bethany it played a role in other references in Scripture. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem was prepared there. I mentioned last week that Jesus would have stayed overnight during Holy Week before the events of Good Friday and the cross at Bethany. And Scripture mentions that in Bethany it would have been a natural place for Jesus to go because of Three close people who lived there, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Now it was outside of Bethany that Jesus made his last earthly footprints. Scripture tells us, and he, meaning Jesus, led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And so that last, go back to that last one, Elizabeth. That supposedly is the last spot that they recognize where Jesus was before the ascension. Okay, you can go forward. Bethany, it was also the setting for a future prophecy. In Zechariah 14, it says that when the Lord returns one day, it says... On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And all that things are, are, are fascinating, but while Bethany played a role in Scripture and in the life of God's people, tonight we're focusing on this building here. We're focusing on our gospel lesson at Bethany, a dinner party, one of the last, although it seems that the disciples might not be grasping that it's the last quite yet. There we meet a woman, and this is supposed to be the remains of her home. Her name's Mary, the sister of Lazarus and Martha. Jesus sees that sign in the leper's home along with Jesus' disciples, and, and Mary was there as well. And Mary being there was unusual. Normally, women didn't join men in public events like this, but we read that Mary has a specific purpose in mind. A woman came up to him with an alabaster flask, we're told, a very expensive ointment. 
and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. In the Gospel of John, it also adds a reference to pouring some oil on Jesus' feet. You know, offering someone oil, while it's weird today, it wasn't unusual in Jesus' time. Oil was offered to guests as a way of honoring them and welcoming them into your home. But what Mary was doing is unusual. She's not using uh, this common anointing or cleansing oil, but she's using something called pure nard. It's a perfume from India. It's quite aromatic and quite expensive. How much? Well, we're told in John that the alabaster flask, similar to this, was, would have had a year's worth of income of, of this, this material in it, this nard. And put it in perspective, I looked today and it said that the average Canadian today it makes 54630 a year. So imagine pouring out almost $55,000 of liquid just like that. And yet that's what she did. But cost doesn't seem to, to matter to Mary. Neither does the way that she dispenses it. We're told she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. And then John adds, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. You know, there's two things to make note of. First, Mary pours out very expensive perfume with, with just total abandon. She opens it up and empties it out to the very last drop. The second thing, a respectable woman such as Mary, a woman who obviously comes from some sort of wealth, would never have let her hair down in public. And then on top of it, to use her hair to wipe the oil run, that would have been unheard of. That was the action of a lowly servant. But Mary knows who's in front of her. You know, it's obvious that this woman loved Jesus so much. She loved him so much because of his ministry, he must have shown her how much he loved her first. And so Mary, she felt that she wanted to show, she wanted to express in a tangible way how much she wants to express her thanks while there is still time, we're told. And you know, that's the key for the lesson tonight, the understanding of time. You see, as everyone in the room watches Mary while being extravagant with this excessive, way over the top thing, the disciples, well, we're told when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why the waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. And while Matthew doesn't say it, John, in this same event as he records it, he does tell us the motivation of at least one of the disciples' indignation. He said, But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? But then it says, He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. And you know, while that's bad enough in and of itself, what's worse is that the rest of the disciples, they see no reason for this outpouring of affection at all. They don't get what's coming. The Apostle Paul, he wrote, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You see, Jesus had previously foretold that he would have to suffer and die. Jesus knew and he warned that the cross was moving ahead, coming very quickly, but the disciples, they weren't connecting the dots. They just didn't want to hear it. No, instead they react the way the ten react when James and John tried to weasel their way into the two places of glory with Jesus. Of anger and indignation. 
the disciples responded to Mary's action the way the chief priests and the scribes often objected to joy and amazement that Jesus' words and deeds, how it had brought those kind of emotions. The disciples, they became angry and aggressive at what Mary had done. One of the commentators I read, he said, the disciples show the depth of their misunderstanding by thinking in terms of ordinary, normal life, rather than in terms of the unique events that are unfolding before their very eyes. To be specific, he said, the disciples react as if Jesus had never said, you know that after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. You know, the disciples then, we, we just don't get it whenever we read the account, how they couldn't get it. But there are times when you and I, we forget as well, don't we? We set aside the fact of all that Jesus has accomplished for us. His forgiveness, his love, his salvation, his guiding and directing and blessing and, and in his hand just in our lives every day and the eternal home that he's prepared for us. We get so caught up in the world and our day-to-day -day lives that, that we maybe just don't dwell on much of what God has and continues to do in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. We let the things of this world take the front seat, the driver's seat, controlling our direction and destination, our actions and our words and our sights and our thoughts. I mean, how many live in this world as if this life, there was only this life? They live for today, don't worry about tomorrow. Nothing more beyond this moment we call earthly life. You see, that's the, the tunnel vision that the disciples had in their moment with Mary. And the result for us is that we can become blind to what Jesus has truly accomplished for us. And that blindness, it robs us of the opportunity to appreciate, to rejoice, to share, to be extravagant in thanks. And in praise, Lent can become just a, another season of the church here. Another service to gather for, another sermon to prepare and hear. Or, what we see in our account for Mary, Mary points us in another direction. She invites us to see and hear all that Jesus has done for us. To hear his words, to read them, to ponder them, to apply them, so that we can let Jesus' ministry, his love, his forgiveness and repentance pour over each one of us like oil to soothe our souls, calm our troubled hearts, to unburden the heaviness that we struggle to bear as the Spirit applies God's peace and comfort and hope and confidence that covers our lives while there is still time. You see, we are given as well the desire to respond in thanks and praise. The Spirit's working that in us to share with others the joy that is ours. All thanks to the Father and the Son's love that's revealed in Christ Jesus. And he gives us that opportunity while there is still time. You know, Jesus, he said to the disciples, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me in pouring this ointment on my body. She has done it to prepare me for burial. And this is an old picture of what Golgotha looked like, the place where Jesus died to be buried then. Jesus knew what was coming. He knew the betrayal by Judas, Denial by Peter, abandoned by all of his disciples, being tried and convicted, and, and, and the supposed leaders of God are the ones who convicted him. Sentenced by Pilate, scourged by soldiers, crown of thorns, mocked by the crowds, even abandoned by his heavenly Father. Jesus is suffering and dying in death 
theft of the guilty, although he was innocent. This is what laid ahead for him. Paying for the sins that he had never committed. The innocent becoming guilty and then succumbing to death. Being buried, all of this, for all people, for all time, for you and for me. You see, Mary, in her moment, she prepared Jesus and even herself for the events to unfold that would bring salvation. You and I, we have just begun the Lenten season. As we continue on our Lenten journey, we're visiting the places of the Passion so that we will see the sights and be reminded of the gift that has been given to us undeservingly, yet forgiven sinners. A restored relationship with the Father, an eternal hope, a life with the Lord each day. Mary wanted us to see, and we remember, we want, she wanted us to see her rejoicing so that we as well would rejoice. Because you know, as you and I, as we see we will be inspired. We will be equipped. We will be placed in opportunities to show our thanks and response for what is ours. All thanks to Jesus. All thanks to his Lenten journey. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds clinging to Christ Jesus. Amen. At this time, the offering will be brought forward. rise for prayer. Gracious God, give us generous hearts to give without counting the cost, to share without expecting anything in return, to hold all of our treasures with open hands, to have gospel priorities that align our life, our love, and our time in their light, to know the freedom that comes with generosity, to give like the Israelites who continue to bring free will offerings morning after morning, to give like the Macedonians who urgently pleaded for the privilege of sharing, to give like Mary joyfully, exceedingly, and lavishly, to give like Jesus lovingly, faithfully, and abundantly. Father, we recall the words of our Savior. I tell you the truth. Wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. <coughs> and so we pray, Take my love, my Lord, I pour, at your feet and treasure store. Take myself and I will be, ever only all for thee. Jesus, let me faithful be, Life eternal grant to me. Amen. And we pray the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus invites us to walk with him to Bethany, a place of great suffering and a place of great love. We will walk with Jesus all the way to the empty tomb and resurrection victory. The blessing of Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you now and eternally. Amen. Amen.
Let us ever walk with Jesus. We sing our closing hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be.